Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's instruction discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion, where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. While the purpose of this show is really to highlight and discuss educational trends, Every so often, I like to take a different turn and give the students some shine. We have had student representatives and student entrepreneurs, authors, and a Girl Scout Award Gold Award winners, all dynamic in their own rights. Today's guest is no different. As a competitive international style ballroom Latin dancer, New York City native Haley Yegorov earned the title of Master of Sports of Ukraine for competitive dancing and competed internationally for years. As a result of his travel schedule, he needed to take online classes and graduated summa cum laude with an associate's degree in criminal justice. His achievements have led him to being recognized as one of the six graduates of the year by Penn Foster Group, a leader in, in providing affordable digital and data-driven learning solutions. The achievements don't stop there. While with the NYPD Auxiliary, Haley received the Police Commissioner's Award for Valedictorian Merit and continues to teach dance as he aspires to pursue a career in law enforcement and eventually attend law school. We know that there are many ways to define success, and with the help of Penn Foster Group, Haley is finding his way to success. So today, let's welcome Haley Edgar Yegorov. To instruction discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. No, no. Thank you for being here and for having such a dynamic and eclectic background. I know a lot of people are probably wondering, how do you get involved in ballroom dance? And because we've seen Dancing with the Stars on TV and so forth, but some people may not realize that it is a it's an actual thing that the ballroom Latin dancing is an actual thing. So what drew you to competitive ballroom Latin dancing in the first place? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I started ballroom dancing in in New York City and the community here for ballroom dancing is really big, very extensive. And at seven years old, I took my first classes and did my first competitions. And I sort of just grabbed onto it and stuck with it the whole way. It eventually led to me moving overseas and competing there. Um, ballroom dancing for me was was a way to kind of outside of school hours, you know, elementary school, middle school, sort of find different ways to express myself. And the competitive aspect of it was also a great way to just, you know, win prizes, win trophies, and just dance all the while. Oh, nice, nice. So how did you actually earn that title of Master of Sports of Ukraine for competitive dancing? It sounds so official, so formal. How did you get that title? <laughs> It does sound very official. It's a it's a Ukrainian title. It's given to to many people. It's a sort of achievement title that's obtained by you know competing in Ukraine at the national championships, winning awards, making finals, and so on. When I lived in Ukraine, I competed all over the country. I competed in almost every city. It was just traveling every day, competition every day. It was a really great experience, and eventually that culminated in me earning a title for that. Well, that for that record. That that sounds quite interesting in and of itself. Just what? So, what was it really like re being in Ukraine? Were you there by yourself, or did were the family members come along with you? Or how old were you at that point when you made that transition to be in in Ukraine? Well, I was sixteen, and it was my first time moving out of the United States, as one normally doesn't do at sixteen. Um, I was put into a brand new environment. I was alone. Uh, my mother took me there, then she left eventually back for, back for New York. Um, it was an experience at 16 years old. Thankfully, I knew the language somewhat, but it was completely different from the United States. Everything is different. The way the language, the culture, the stores, you know, just the customs of how you live. It was adapting to it was a real, really big experience. And I always recommend to people, hey, if you have the opportunity, go to a different country. It just opens your mind up to so many new things. I would have to imagine that the 
amount of, I guess, the level of homesickness really started to settle in after a while, even with the the busy schedule. I'm, and I'm sure. And talk to us a little bit about that. What was the that schedule like? Competing, training, and competing, and training, and competing. And how often did you really get to to uh, communicate with people back home? Oh yeah, the homesickness is real. But the schedule, you know, it would involve at least forty hours of training a week. You'd wake up early. You do your physical preparation, you know, gym exercise. Then you'd have group classes. You have practice sessions. You have individual lessons. You travel out of the country for individual lessons. People would come from different countries. It was jam packed. You'd have little time for yourself. And thankfully, I was able to travel back and forth every once in a while and see my friends and so on. So keeping in touch with my New York world wasn't that much of a challenge. The time zone difference and just being busy every day. Most of my friends knew me as just busy. That was the label they gave me because from morning to evening, I'd be dancing, training. I can imagine if they looked at your your calendar, it would always it, everything would be blocked out because you're always doing something. And how did you schedule? Like you probably had to schedule sleep time in there as well because everything else was it was so so structured and so scheduled. You know, it sounds funny, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> everything was packed but i i personally believe that is that's a great way to live life when you're busy at every corner it's just so engaging and it keeps you on on your toes so now you say you went over there at at 16 so that was probably right in the middle of high school um so did, yeah. did you continue your high school studies there and how did how did you manage the the i guess the the, the typical high school social life as far as, you know, the senior prom and, and getting your driver's license and all those types of things? Well, I had to transfer from my physical high school in New York City to a Penn Foster high school, which is actually, fast forward, it's the reason I got into Ashworth. But yes, it was a Penn Foster high school called James Madison High School. And I was able to do all my courses online while I lived in Ukraine, despite the, the schedule and the, and the busyness. And um, in terms of prom and, you know, that high school experience, I never really got a feel of it. With the time I had, I could sort of go to my friends' proms in their Ukrainian schools and sort of fill in the blanks with that. That's essentially how I went about it. Okay, okay. So uh, so let's talk a little bit more about that, the, the educational experience. How did you uh, settle on Penn Foster as for your to make up those those classes, or was that something that was kind of directed for you? So for high school or for college? For high school, let's start with high school. For high school, um, I think my mom just found it online, and she put me into it, and the program seemed to fit. I could do it whenever I want. I had everything in front of me, and it was very convenient, especially for living overseas. Um, so that's how I got into the high school. My mom just sort of found it, got me into it. Okay, great, and I and I guess all of the the courses were, um, I guess state require they they met all the state requirements because I assume you got a uh, a New York State uh, high school diploma out of all of that, and so those courses were able to satisfy that, or was it a regular just like a general diploma? I think it was a general one. I don't recall getting a New York State uh, high school diploma from out of it. Okay, now how. This may be a question you may or may not be able to, to answer, but and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are thinking of are wondering this as well. How were you able to actually how were you selected? Number one, how were you selected to travel over to Ukraine and, and Europe and do all the other? And how were you able to fund all of that? Was it was this a, like a scholarship program that you were involved in or? How did the, the funding work to get all those private tutors and uh, and teachers and so forth? Well, ballroom dancing is a very expensive endeavor, to say the least. If any any listeners have ballroom danced in the past, they will know just just how much money goes into it. So funding it is is quite a challenge, especially at that age. When I moved to Ukraine, and it was of my own volition, I flew over there. You know, I told my mom, hey, I want to do this. She obliged. Uh, when I landed there, I had to sort of I used my parents' help, but eventually I started finding my own work. I would do freelance work here and there, translating, and eventually I came to open my own school in Ukraine. It was like a two-year project where I taught English, and that was a great way to fund the dancing. Oh, how was how was that teaching English to? And what type of I guess what was the age of the students that you worked with to do that? It was everybody. We we found a spot in the city 
in the office. We renovated it. We put out for commercials saying, hey, it's this is an English school. You have an English native speaker come and, t- and talk and learn. And we have people of all age groups come. It was actually impressive how well the marketing worked. We had a, a week of marketing led to 150 new clients signing up, which is insane. Um, but that was very successful. We talked to all age groups. We had events. We had gatherings. It felt less like work and more just fun at the end of the day. But it, it, it was a great English school that I managed to open up at the time. Excellent. So what were some of the, I guess, your most memorable experiences dancing and whether it was here in the in the States or or even abroad? Well, memorable would have to be just the places I traveled to. There was one country I visited in 2019 where I had a dance competition that I found out later isn't even considered a country. It's like a small strip of land between Moldova and Ukraine. That's not recognized by any country, but it's own, its own independent state. And I danced there and I traveled through the goat farms and old Soviet buildings. And I thought to myself, where am I? Look, just yesterday, I was in New York City and here I am in pretty much the middle of nowhere. Um, so those were pretty memorable. Of course, traveling to Russia, for example, a whole different place, um, experiencing the train systems, being out there alone in the middle of winter and just sort of fending for myself. It's a little bit dramatic, but <laughs> that's what it felt like at the time. Um, that was definitely part of the experience, going to different dance clubs overseas, um, getting used to their dynamic of dancing where, you know, you wake up and do a million push-ups and run in, in the night and so on. Yeah. So you, you mentioned dance clubs. Are those like like uh, nightclubs that at, at the, you no. people go to the party in the evening or are those what would they call the actual dance schools? That's what they call the dance schools, da- competitive dance clubs. Uh, in, in Eastern Europe, they're called clubs. I guess here they'd be more like schools. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let, so did you, at, after you became of age, obviously, because I'm sure at, at 16, 17, you probably w- weren't allowed to go into the, the, the nightclubs that they have over there. But or then maybe you were. But when you were of age, did you frequent those uh, establishments as well, trying to pick up other techniques and and just more of the 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 local flair so that you could add that into your style so i actually developed a love for different dance styles when i was in ukraine um i did like you said at the time um when i got a little bit older i started looking venturing more into salsa dancing social dancing and i never thought i'd love it so much and how much it contributed to my regular dancing um and i always recommend salsa dancing now to people uh, thankfully, Ukraine gave me that experience, and now I can do it here in New York, which is the heart of salsa dancing. You are listening to Instruction Discussion on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is National Graduate of the Year, Haley Yagarov. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about that graduate of the year uh, title and, and what it means. I, I, I believe Penn Foster Group is has this uh, um, accolade that they give to some of their their top students who uh, come through their program. So what has the experience been like for you to be named a a, a, gradu- a national graduate of the year? Well, it was surprising. Um, I obviously am very honored by it. Um, I did. I did put a lot of work into it and I didn't expect at the end of the day to be named graduate of the year. So it's 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 nice to see that, you know, I, admittedly, I did put in hard work, and to see it pay off is is is, is I appreciate it. Um, it is also very humbling to have been chosen, and uh, I'm very happy that it happened. And wh- and I know you mentioned it a little briefly earlier, but um, I guess what school did you eventually get the the diploma from that you uh, went through Penn uh, Penn Foster? Yeah, it was Ashworth College in Norcross, Georgia. And, and I guess that they had everything that you were looking for in a school, in a program, in a particular program. And so how did you settle on that particular school? So since my high school was a Penn Foster one, I, the, the system just was really comfortable for me overseas. I'd be able to do all my courses and classes without really worrying about time frames. And I thought, you know what? I got so used to it. Why not just do Ashworth College? And it was, I was meet, I was met with the same system with the same expectations I had, but now harder courses and new goals of mine that I had to reach. 
were any of those courses, uh, I know it would be kind of tough to do this, but were any of those courses or any part of it still face to face where you actually had to meet with somebody at a particular time or was the entire thing just kind of you do it when you can and just turn in the lessons at a particular at a, at a stated uh, time frame? Yep, it was the latter. It was you do the lessons, you turn them in a particular time frame. We never really had meetings face to face, but that was the system. And I really enjoyed that because it worked for me. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people who would uh, who would probably welcome that as well, because since there's no brick and mortar building to go to that you have to worry about going to, you kind of fit the coursework in when you can. You, you know, you have a deadline to turn everything in, but now you can kind of fit all the, the studies and the coursework in where it, it suits you as opposed to you trying to stress about cutting one appointment short so that you could get to a designated to get in front of the computer as a, at a designated time to get everything done. So I think, I guess it does have its advantages. Yeah, absolutely. It's a unique experience and it, for those who need it, it's there. So how did you settle on uh, law enforcement? Why, why did you choose the, that particular course of study and, and where do you think that's going to take you? So it's interesting. Right now, I'm in a very gray zone. I'm not sure what I'm doing, but I know that I chose it because criminal justice is related to the law, and I always was fascinated by it. Um, I pursued it because I thought, you know what, why not try law enforcement? I feel like it's something I would always want to try, and I wouldn't want to grow older not having tried it. So that was my initial goal. After I graduated, I got hired by a law firm, um, and I work as a paralegal now while I'm still pending my law enforcement process. So right now I'm in this sort of limbo where, you know, I have two directions I can go into, you know, it's a lot of opportunities. Uh, but the subject matter for me was interesting mm. to answer your question. And it just seems like it could be something I would be good at based on the fact that I enjoy it so much. Yeah, because it, it struck me as as interesting because you have this great background and love for for dancing. So you would think that you may choose a a major or course of study that would help to allow you to utilize those experiences. And but yet you went into uh, criminal justice. So is there any way to what's the correlation there? How is there any way that you might be able to marry those two at some point? I suppose there is none, but at the end of the day, the dancing doesn't have to stop. I still dance frequently and I'll always find a way to combine the two. And I think it's, you know, I never have it in my plans to stop doing one and start something else. I'll just find ways to incorporate both. Now, I know you said that currently you work as a paralegal, but what was your experience with the NYPD auxiliary and what was there any particular special training that you had to go through to get to be a part of that? Uh, what, What was that whole experience like? Yeah, so auxiliary, and I still volunteer to this day. It is a, the NYPD auxiliary is a group of civilians that are members of the NYPD who help sort of observe, react, report, and just sort of fill in as a crime suppression. Um, The NYPD auxiliary has a training program. It's an eight-week program that you do in your local borough of New York City, and they teach you all the basics you need to know, uh, criminal law, they teach you self-defense, they teach you traffic control, um, policy and so on and it just provides you with a way to get back to your city to go out there in the field uniformed with your partners and lend a helping hand and just do good and it's a very satisfying direction as well uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that because you are still cl- classified as civilians and that you are volunteers for the most part that you're not walking around with any weapons no weapons we just have a baton for all intents and purposes, that's just like a self-defense tool. Right, right. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds, now, let's go back a little a minute to your, your ballroom experience. And I know you were a, or you probably still are, a, a teacher of, of ballroom dancing as well. Have you thought about uh, possibly, I don't know, taking those experiences into any of the public schools to kind of teach ballroom dancing to to younger people to kind of get generate their interest the same way that your interest was sparked so long ago? Well, as a matter of fact, that is the case. That's what I did in uh, last winter and fall. I enrolled in a program that brings dancing to public schools in New York City. And I was a teacher 
for that period of time, still am, but we're out for summer break, where I travel to public schools and I teach kids how to dance. And that in itself is also a very rewarding experience. Yeah, I can imagine because I know there are, uh, one, there are a lot of people who, a lot of children that may not be interested in the typical, you know, basketball and other gym type of activities. So having some an alternative for them to experience may be a, a good thing for them. Oh, it was incredible. I had kids the first few days say, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. I want to play basketball. And near the end, they were fully engaged in it. They were performing. They were happy. And that repeated itself quite frequently, which I always love to see. Yeah, when when I was a uh, a, a, an assistant principal in the Bronx, we had a program that we brought in. It was called, uh, I think, was Mad Hot Ballroom, and where we we taught ballroom dancing was taught to our students and during their gym period and and some other periods, so that they were actually became. Uh, they perform. They actually develop well enough so that they could have some sort of a, an assembly program for parents and other people to come in and, and witness. And you're right. They all, to a person, they loved it. At first, there was some pushback. It was, oh, why, can't, why we have to do dancing and that's for girls and all that kind of thing. But everybody got into it and they really enjoyed it. And it was a, a skill that yeah, I even – picked up a few steps myself that I used during my wedding. But, uh, and so that helped out as well, but yeah, it's a thing that it's a different way of expressing yourself. And, um, and I think that a lot of the students found that as a way that they could still get some exercise without doing the traditional type of gym activities. Absolutely. And for the students themselves, it gives them a lot of skills that they normally wouldn't get from other sources. So, you know, social skills, partnering skills, learning choreography. These are not usual things that students do. And um, that kind of outlet for them helps them get those skills, which is another benefit of it. Let's talk a minute about the, the, the physical demands of especially competitive ballroom dancing. Most people, you think, oh, it, ballroom dancing, it's just very elegant and, and with the strides and, and the flowing movements and everything but they don't realize exactly just how strenuous physically taxing and mentally taxing something like this can be. So talk to us a little bit about just the, the physical and mental demands of, of a ballroom dancing. And if you can compare that to the physicality of your typical sports. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that stands out the most from typical sports would be the fact that you're dancing with a partner and it's not only, um, you focusing on yourself and your cap capabilities and your readiness, but you're also focusing on your partner and both of you as a whole. So you both have to be training. You both have to be training within each other. You both have to make time to meet and you both have to make time to understand how your bodies work so you can manipulate each other during the dance. And that is a huge difference from contemporary sports where it's really you, your team, and, um, but you depend really on yourself and your physical capabilities in that moment. As for dancing, um, the typical format is that competitions last from, they can last from morning to midday or morning to night. And it is composed of a series of um, rounds where you compete in order to get to the final, you know, quarterfinal, semifinal, final. And these rounds can be 10 and a half minutes of nonstop dancing. So full energy with your partner, moving each other around the floor and just giving it your all because at any second there could be a judge watching you and scoring you depending on what he thinks is considered good dancing. So not only do you have to be physically fit, but you have to make sure your partnership is physically fit, that you're both mentally prepared to face competitions where you're going to be judged by various judges with different needs and that you can accommodate all of that and do your best on the competition floor. Wow. So it, it sounds like you really need to have a a, a solid um, physical foundation in order to really compete at the, some of these at the highest levels. And so to speak. So I think having th those training sessions when you talked about going to the gym and, and so forth, that those are v vital, especially the, with the cardio, the, just for the, the stamina aspect of it. Oh, yeah. A lot of the guys, we supplemented it. We supplemented it with uh, soccer, with, you know, wrestling, martial arts. I did boxing to help me get, you know, that endurance. 
and a, a lot of people would supplement their dancing with these types of things. Well, that sounds very, very interesting. And, and again, I think that a lot of our, our listeners would be uh, enthralled to, to know how can they get involved in something like this. So how was it that you initially got involved with uh, the dancing, whether it was it may not be at seven, but at any point, how can somebody get involved with uh, with ballroom dancing? Well, there are in America, we have ballroom studios everywhere. Um no matter where you are, you're definitely going to have one nearby within reason. Um, and they're always looking for new students. They always have these accommodations for new students wherein you can train and then compete and then wear dresses and suits. And what I'm trying to say is it's all very readily available. That You don't really have to jump through hoops. You just have to visit your local ballroom dance studio. It's going to be there. Um, so to get into it is quite easy. It's staying with it that might seem like a challenge at first but in my experience most people who start doing it can't stop and and as far as the uh company that you're with it to when you go back into the schools what do, what particular schools or, or are they are you in or is it just within the the five boroughs or do you kind of branch out to some of the the other schools around new york city the program i'm with is called notes in motion and we work in New York City, within the five boroughs, within public schools. Yeah. And at that point, do you also kind of look to see if you can recognize any particular talent that you may want to have those students maybe go a little bit further if, or, or pre- at least present the option for them to go a little bit further with this going forward? With dancing itself? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's tons of hidden talent in these schools at every corner. And whenever I teach, I see these kids who really want to. And... You know, it's interesting. They don't necessarily have to be very good at it, but you can see it in their eyes that they want to do it and they're ready to commit to it. And that for me is talent. And I always tell them, hey, keep going with this. Go further. You never know where it'll take you. And, you know, I think that's the important lesson right here that we need to understand that no matter what your talent or skill level is, keep at it and you never know where it can take you. It can take you all over the world, literally, as in your case. But we would certainly like Absolutely. to thank we would certainly like to thank today our guest, Penn Foster Group National Graduate of the Year and New York City native, Haley Edgar Yegorov, for coming on to our show today. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.